This is the one video that College Board does not want you to see because today we're exposing their dirty little secret. But the question everybody has is, will the March SAT be harder? Well, I don't want to waste any of your time, guys. The March SAT will feel harder than usual. It will feel harder than your Blue Book practice tests. If you, say, took the SAT back in December, November, it will feel harder than that on average, okay? And you might be like, okay, what do you mean? Well, there's a couple things and a couple things I want to explain. Uh, first off, I just want to get out of the way that everyone gets different questions. You get a form which has different strings of questions. So everybody will get a different testing experience, right? You will see different questions. There might be overlaps, but on average, everybody has a different testing experience. However, for March, everybody will essentially get the same trends. What does that mean? Well, you have to think about what happens between the December and the March SAT. That's three months of time. We know that College Board, what they do is after every single SAT, and especially at the start of a new year, they analyze all the data, right? They look at all the questions they made and they analyze the data to create new questions, right? And when you develop new questions, that means these questions have very minimal practice material that is out there. If you guys remember back in 2024, when the March SAT was first administered in the US, it was a massacre. <laughs> it was a massacre because people were misled by the blue book practice tests and got a bunch of weird questions on the test that you know nowadays wouldn't be considered that hard. But back then, because they've never seen those types of questions, were just completely thrown off. And when you're in a testing setting, that makes a huge difference. Okay. You might also see this thing called unpretested child questions. I've explained what this is in previous videos, but I will do that again because I think it's super important and it's a big proponent of why the March SAT will feel harder. Doesn't necessarily mean that it actually is objectively harder in terms of the questions and its difficulty deemed by College Board, but to students, it will feel harder. All right. Number two, the March SAT is a super popular test date. Okay. Like you get all the sweaty juniors taking the SAT, unlike something like the November or, or October SAT, right? That's when you have super stressed seniors who are doing their college applications, taking the SAT for probably the last time, right? They have other priorities, but the March SAT, you have all these juniors who are hungry, right? They've had months to, months to prepare. They've had this test date on their radar and they are going to take the SAT, right? And, you know, for some of them, they might have to retake in the future, but for a lot of them, they're just taking it one and done, right? And in reality, that doesn't really mean anything to you, right? Because, okay, who cares if you have a bunch of people who maybe will do better on average on the SAT? Well, that is where the question of a curve comes in, right? If there was no curve on the SAT, who cares? That wouldn't be a problem. Except the practices that College Board uses don't really support that. You no, know, there is indeed a hidden curve and I will explain that later. By the end of this video, I will have proved that the SAT has a hidden curve, but for the rest of you who don't care to know, uh, what should you do? Because this random guy on YouTube is telling me that the March SAT is gonna be harder. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing, all right? Some things are just out of your control and unfortunately College Board is that sort of company. Um, but you should also focus on test taking strategies. I know that sounds generic and stupid and although practice questions are the best way to prepare for SAT, if you want the highest ROI for your time in terms of your score, you need to focus on knowing the approach for different types of questions. Um, and even when it comes down to just general tips, like eliminating variables, plenty of videos that cover test taking strategies, not just the generic ones, so definitely check those out. But now let's prove that the SAT has a curve. Um, if you want even a more in-depth look on this, I have one video. One of the videos was kind of scuffed, I would say, but I will link the one with the more uh, better depth and actual accurate information 100% in the links in the description. Um, but this is like the one to two minute summary. All right. So up here is a excerpt of a little section from the SAT technicals manual. So this is straight from the college board's mouth. Um, so you can see here that they said blah, 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 hypothesis. We take a representative subset of the child items or child questions from each parent model and they pretest it on a large sample of digital SAT, blah, blah, blah. So they uh, test these child questions on a population. Okay, what is a child question and what is a parent question? A parent question is essentially a question that is super general and it serves sort of as a template, right, for a college board because they are not going to create like 50 unique questions. They need like a template so they can like gauge the relative difficulty, 
right? So they have the overarching parent model, and then they have their child questions. They generate variations of the parent model based on its characteristics and maybe the concepts that it's testing. And so you have tons of child questions, right? So what they need to do now is to see, okay, are these child questions similar in difficulty? So what they do is College Board takes a quote unquote representative group of child questions to be tested. These are the experimental questions you see on your actual digital SAT, right? These are child questions. These are pre-tested child questions. Um, so what happens now is if it passes, right? If child questions perform within plus minus 0 0.05 in terms of the performance that College Board uh, sets out for the standard of each other, then all the child questions are assumed to be the same and the other untested child questions are used in real SATs. I'll explain what that means later, but if it doesn't pass, then everything gets scrapped, revised, tested again, right? But what does this mean? This means that not every single question that you see on your digital SAT will be vetted beforehand, right? So these questions, you will see questions that have not been tested on a group of students before showing up on your SAT. In these questions, because College Board deemed them to be representative within other child questions, will count towards your score. If they count towards your score, you're probably wondering, okay, well, that's not fair because what if a question ends up being harder than usual, right? But then comes the question of how do you gauge whether a question was actually easier or harder than usual? Well, pretty easy. You look at other people's performances. And that's why it takes College Board two weeks to give you your digital SAT scores. If you take in a blue book practice test, you know the scores are instantly out, right? And sure, you could, you know, chalk it up to be security things or whatever, right? But security does not take two weeks, okay? It takes two weeks because they're doing this curve process, okay? What they're doing is they're looking at all the child questions that weren't pre-tested before, right? They're looking at the child questions that weren't pre-tested before to see if they actually were up to the standard, right? In similar difficulty. And so let's say you get a question that everybody missed, right? Because College Board said, you know what? We think it's representative and it should theoretically perform the same. But for some reason, because of the string of questions, you know, the pattern, you know, the, let's say it was put at the end of the test, right? Question 22, there's fatigue by the students or some crazy thing like that. Then what happens is they go back in and they see the statistics and they're like, okay, a disproportionate amount of students missed this question. That means it must actually be harder than we initially deemed it to be, and so we should dock less points from these students onto their score. It works in the reverse, and that's why it makes the March SAT harder, right? Think about it, logically, all right? If you get a question where your test-taking subset of students are very high-performing, right, like the sweaty juniors in March, then what happens is you're going to answer questions, on average, better than you would another subset of students. Right. And so let's say College Board goes in and they see a question where everybody got it right. You know, more people got it right than they expected. Then they're probably thinking to themselves, huh, well, that must mean that this question was easier than expected. I'm trying to scale everything to make it quote unquote standardized. And so for the students who missed that question because of other students' performances, we'll get docked more points. All right. And that is just, it's sad. It's very, it's very distraught. It's very, it's corruption. All right. Um, if you don't believe what I'm saying, just watch the video on the screen right now. It will explain everything in much more depth. And the last part I said about, you know, College Board doing all this initial scale conformatory, all that, it's true. It's in the document. It's in the technicals manual. I'll link it in the description as well. If you want to see me cover it in the video, I'll, you can click the video and look for yourself. Um, but this video is already getting too long. So I'm going to leave it at that. Good luck on your March SAT, and I'll see you guys in the next video.